Our scripture this morning is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's pray as we always do over God's word. Lord, we pray that you'd bless your word as it comes to us that it would be used for your glory and your purposes. Bless us, that we might receive your word, that we might hear it and understand it, but more than that, that we might then act upon it. That we might understand what you want and be your faithful children. Lord, we pray for our nation in this time of fear. We pray for those suffering and those afraid. We pray for the doctors and nurses who are risking their lives to treat all of us. We pray for their families who have not seen their mother, their father, their loved one in a few weeks. Father, we pray that you would take this disaster and turn it for your glory. Let your glory, your wonder, your providential love over us be so apparent that all stand and cheer your greatness. Father, we pray for our president, the many women who make up our Congress, our governor, our state and local representatives, all those who make decisions that affect our lives, that you would grant them your wisdom, that you would use them for your purposes. In that vein of thought, Lord, bless us inasmuch as we make decisions that affect the lives of others. Give us wisdom. Equip us to serve that we might be a blessing. Lord, we know that you require your people to be holy and we confess our sin. We beg your mercy and we trust your faithfulness that you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us, Father, that we might be clean vessels in your hand and then use us for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We're on the last week in our series on Christian hope. We began five weeks ago by saying that we are the adopted children of God through Jesus Christ. And inasmuch as we're adopted children, we depend on Jesus as our foundation, as our anchor. We build what we build upon him. We said four weeks ago that God's word and God's promise are certain. We can trust God. A journey through the Bible, searching for the promises of God, will make you rich. Rich in spirit, rich in confidence, rich in hope, and rich in wisdom. That means that we depend on God's grace. His grace means his favor. His gift, his free gift. We depend on God. It's tragedy that lets us know we're not in control of our own lives. We could step out the front door today and have a meteorite fall upon us. Or tree limb. We can go onto the highway and through no fault of our own have a fatal crash. We're not in control, though often when times are good, we fool ourselves into thinking we are. No, God is in control. 
and we depend on him. We said three weeks ago that there are too many people who live without hope. And the verse we read said that we have been called out of the darkness into God's marvelous light because we who have been in the darkness understand it. We know the misery of those who are lost. We know the confusion. We know the doubt. We know the temptation. And we are to hope then for the lost. It's not enough that we be saved. We must be, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, ambassadors of the ministry of reconciliation where we reconcile God and man. We do that for one another. We do that for the lost. We said two weeks ago, a heavenly promise that's almost too good to believe. But it is a promise in God's word that one day, after judgment day, we shall be presented before the throne of glory in glory by Jesus Christ himself. Our hope then is to be like Jesus. As Paul put it in Ephesians, that we are to be transformed to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Last week, we said that we are called to shout God's praises. And I said that the problem too many of us have is we have a small God. And that makes our problems all the bigger. But the bigger our God, the smaller our fears. The smaller our problems. Great faith comes from great trials. As we praise God, as he grows in our understanding, his power over the world becomes more obvious and we are consoled. Today we finish up that with the fact that we are to accept Christ-likeness. The Bible promises we shall be like Christ. And we as Christians need to accept that, make plans for that. Make our, base our future upon that. To that end, Paul had, John has two main points. Meditation and service. We are to consider that we will be like Jesus. Stop and think about it. Understand what that means. Understand what we're going to lose. Understand what will be cut off of us or plucked out of us. Or burned away from us. Understand that we're not going to take to heaven the things that we hold to so tightly here on earth. There are a lot of things we care about here that just won't matter. And in their place will be the things of Jesus Christ. We need to consider that as we value the world and service. If I am going to be like Jesus, perfectly in heaven, and if I am growing into Christ-likeness now, then I am a part of the body of Christ, and I need to be about the service of Jesus on earth. I must be doing what Jesus would do. A marriage given over to Jesus is blessed. What would your marriage be like if you were substituted out of the equation and Jesus Christ were substituted in, what kind of spouse would you be? What kind of father, what kind of mother would you be if Jesus stood in your shoes? What kind of friend? We are called to be like Jesus. That is our greatest challenge. The Bible says we shall be like Jesus. That's not just a prediction that's a guarantee. And if I'm going to be like Jesus, what's going to have to change? What am I going to have to do differently? What should I be doing differently now? You know, ours is an empowering hope. But our power does not come from wealth or things or achievements. Our hope is a transforming hope. Jesus said that to be saved, you have to be converted. 
There's no salvation without conversion. If I'm not changed, I'm not saved. I remember years ago reading a story from Billy Graham where he said right after World War II, there was a woman in London who was giving speeches against Christianity. She mocked Christianity and she argued against it. And finally a man stood up, a huge man, with scars all over his face and all over his knuckles from fighting. He said, most people here know me. There's not a woman here I haven't molested. There's not a man here, a husband here I haven't beaten up. I've beaten everyone, including my own wife. But Jesus Christ saved me. And when he did, he changed me, and I'm no longer that man. And he said, Madam, if that be myth, it be powerful myth. It changed a man's life. Years ago, I had a liquor store operator when I was pastoring up in the mountains ask if uh, our church would take a fellow like him. I said, of course. We'd be glad to have you join our church and come to know Jesus. But we would expect that once Jesus got a hold of you, you'd sell the store. We are converted, and that's our power. We are changed. The lost mock us, and rightly so, when we act like the world. It's a strange thing. They beg us to be like them. They insist we be like them. But the moment we are, they point a finger and say, Ha, huh, you're no different. We are called to be different. We are called to be converted. John tells us in verse 1, Behold, what manner of love Look, he says, at the manner of love that God the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Notice he doesn't have the words to explain it. He just says, look, consider, meditate on how great God's love is and how much love he's poured out over us that we should be called the children of God. You know it would be good enough. Salvation would be good enough for me if I were simply allowed to go in. There's a gospel group from my hometown. Used to have a song saying, I don't care if I get a mansion or not. I just want a pup tent inside the gates of heaven. And if I were to go to heaven smelling of smoke, I'd be thrilled. But God says, no, that's not good enough. I have plans for you. You are my child. He says that to every one of his saved. We are his adopted children through Jesus, through Jesus Christ. Consider the God who promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us has made us his children. So we are different. And John says, therefore, because we're different, the world does not know us, for they did not know him. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, but the natural man, that means the man of flesh, the, the carnal man, the man who's lost. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. The lost can't understand that which is spiritual. It's interesting, we live in a world that claims spirituality. People find their spirituality in crystals, in relics, in certain meditations, in drugs. But there is nothing but the Spirit of God that is true. There is no spirituality except in Jesus Christ. That's why the world doesn't understand us. Right now, Samaritan's Purse is in New York. Now understand, they've set up 14 tents 
hospital tents where they are caring for those suffering with COVID. Now, they have great experience. They have doctors with experience in the Ebola virus. They put tents in Africa and treated the sick there. They have set tents up all over northern Italy treating those who have died who are suffering from the virus. Yet when they come to New York to set up tents in Central Park for medical clinics, free medical clinics, the mayor of New York said he was bothered, he was disturbed by their presence there in New York, and he was going to make sure his staff was there to monitor them in case of discrimination. They don't understand because they can't. Even more confusing is that we are lesser versions of Jesus. Now I'll admit, some of us you have to dig awfully deep. But if we are saved, we are justified. We are declared like Jesus. And if we are justified, we are being sanctified. We are being remade like Jesus. And yes, one day we will be glorified, perfect like Jesus. And some of us in the process of sanctification don't give evidence to the presence of Jesus Christ within us. We need to do better. Many of us need to do a lot better. John says, beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. He didn't say it has not been revealed to us. He says it has not been revealed what we shall, what we shall be has not been revealed. The world has, can't see yet the Jesus in us. We can't see yet fully the Jesus in us, but we will. But we know, he says, that when he, when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. What a fantastic promise. We are little versions of Jesus now, and one day we shall be like him. And he says in verse three, and everyone who has this hope in him, has this hope in Jesus, purifies himself. Having the hope purifies me, purifies you just as he, Jesus, is pure. What a relief to know that I will be like Jesus. That is, therefore, the hope of the destruction of sin. You know, sin is the prevailing power in this world, brought here by Adam and Eve. And what a, what a horror sin is. The Bible says sin will not just be erased. It won't just be my, the record of my sins erased from my ledger. But sin itself will be destroyed. My sins will be destroyed. God says wiped away from his, rem it's from his remembrance as far as the east is from the west. In other words, an infinite, an infinite distance. We are to watch sin die. And as it dies, that means the end of shame. You know, nobody wants their privacy taken away. There's none of us who would be willing to volunteer for our brains to be public knowledge. Because in the back of our mind, in the dark recesses of our brain, we each harbor hatred, anger, lust, resentment, sin. We fight them, but in our dark moments, they're there. And no one wants to know what our sins are. We close our curtains for a reason. One day, imagine, no shame. Now, there are people who have no shame, and in our culture, that means terrible people who just don't care. 
But here I mean people who have no shame because there's nothing shameful in their life. That's going to be you and me one day. We shall be without shame because we shall be without sin. We will have new lives, clean lives. Can you imagine you without all the baggage, the joy? Well, if it's a relief, it's also a confidence. It is the hope of sin. That means it's the hope of death. Sin brought death into the world. There was no death when Adam and Eve were first brought here, when they were first created. But because of their sin, death began. Paul tells us in Romans that the wages of sin, the paycheck you receive, the compensates, compensation for sin is death. Without sin, there's no death. One day there'll be no sorrow of death. We have grieved over loved ones lost. We've watched them fade away and it broke our hearts. But one day, that sorrow will be erased. There will be no death, so there will be no sorrow. It also means no fear. Many of us live in fear of death. Without death, no fear. Imagine a world of innocence. Without sin, without shame, without fear, without sorrow. It's also a sweet hope. Because if sin is gone and death is gone, then we will enjoy the hope of restored fellowship. We've lost loved ones. We will regain those who are saved. In heaven, we will see them again. And others whom we never got to know. Think of the grandparents who loved their babies, their grandbabies but then died before those grandbabies were old enough to remember them. We will have the joy of restored fellowship where we will be together again. I kind of grieve myself during, from Thanksgiving to Christmas because so many people I care about are miserable at that time of year. Maybe you haven't considered it, but there are a lot of family holidays from Thanksgiving to Christmas. And, there's a, and if you've had a loved one who's gone on to be with Jesus, you miss them. But you miss them all the more during those big, important family holidays. But we will see them again in heaven. What a hope that that wife you loved for 50 years, you will see again. That mother, that father, you will see again. We will see our brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Well, it's also finally a challenging hope. When he says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. It's the hope of reigning with Christ. The Bible says we are co-inheritors with Jesus Christ of the glories of heaven. And as such, we will be rulers and we will be servants of working alongside Jesus. Now, I don't know fully what that means. But I know this. It'll be as glorious. It'll be as purposeful. It'll be as important as God himself is. We will be doing the Lord's work. We see that today in the promise of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection. Easter's coming up where we celebrate Jesus Christ doing something that had never been done before. Oh, there are others that God brought back to life for a short time, but they died again. Jesus was raised from the dead never to die again. And all over the world, Christians will be celebrating that fact. By the way, please remember that for the Easter sunrise service, we will be at our activities building. Now, 
We're going to stay in our cars. Please don't get out. And we're going to worship as, we, as though we were in a drive-in theater. I will preach, but you'll stay in your car. My family will stay in their car. We won't get out and socialize. But we will be there at 7 o'clock in the morning. The sun rises three minutes before that. And we will celebrate that Jesus Christ is alive. And that power is the power that changes things. Because if God can take death and turn it into life, he can take the dead, death in my heart, the dead spots in my mind, in my soul, and he can bring them to life. He can take my hatred and turn it into love. He can take my lust and turn it into brotherly care. He can take my fears and turn them into joy. God, who takes the dead and brings life, does that in us. And we depend on that. We trust in that. That means we depend on the, also the promise of Jesus' return. He's promised that one day he's coming back for us. And whether we're alive and we see him coming in the clouds or we're dead and we meet him in the air, we will see Jesus. This brings a clarity to his calling because he's coming back and he's going to have an accounting. We're going to serve because we have to. Love demands it. Just as a mother has to go out into traffic to save her baby, we have to do the work of Jesus because of love, a love that compels us. It becomes clear that we are called to be like Jesus. His Holy Spirit within us cries out, for ministry, for service, for a love that puts the other first. You know, the world doesn't need me to be all I can be. The world doesn't need me to be the best version of me that I can be. There are enough great men, enough great women who've gone on before us whom we don't even remember. But one man, Jesus Christ, without television, without computers, without armies, without any wealth at all, turn the world on its ear. What Jesus can do is what the world needs. We need to be like Jesus. That's our need. That's our goal. You know, if you've listened to this sermon this morning and you're lost, you're not a Christian. You're not saved. You may be saying, well, this doesn't sound like an evangelistic pitch. We well, see not every evangelistic sermon has to be a sales pitch. I don't need to be a Madison Avenue salesman. Sometimes the best evangelistic tool is to lay out a challenge. This passage that we've read today is an offer that you can accept or reject. Will you accept the call of God through Jesus Christ? The call to be like him. To leave behind what you've been trying to do to fix your own life. And to be like Jesus. To give yourself to him. And let him lead. Let him instruct. As always. Our church stands ready to answer your call. If you want to comment on YouTube, if you want to message us on Facebook, any way you want to get a hold of us, we stand ready to listen and even pray with you if you need. To lead you to Jesus if that's what you ask. Or accept your testimony that you've already claimed him. As always, in Jesus' service and in yours, I am your pastor. God bless.